230313. Las Cabanas, I said to myself. That's the telephone number of the nightclub. Without waking the porter, I left the room. I had found out what I wanted to know. The two men who had hit me on the head had probably come from Las Cabanas. The porter must have telephoned them when I went up to Elaine Garfield's flat. I was now very interested in Las Cabanas. Elaine Garfield used to go dancing there with Susie. Benny Greep worked there before he was killed. Helen Garfield wanted to meet me there at half past eleven, and now the porter and the two men who had hit me on the head were connected with Las Cabanas. I went home, washed, changed, and had a meal. At eleven o'clock I went out again. I was going to Las Cabanas. There were lots of cars parked outside, and I had to leave the Chrysler quite a long way away from the nightclub. As I walked up to the entrance of Las Cabanas, it started to rain heavily. I knocked on the door, and the little window in the door opened. A face looked at me for a minute. Then the door opened, and I went in. The club no longer looked empty and dirty. Soft lights and sweet music had changed the appearance of the club completely. I stood and looked around. It was a small dance floor on which a few people were dancing. The band was small and not very good. There was a new drummer instead of Benny Greep. Around the dance floor, several groups of people were sitting round low tables. To the right of the dance floor, there were more tables where people were eating. There were two doors behind the tables, which led into the kitchen. I sat down at a table by the dance floor in the darkest part of the room and waited. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. Exactly at 11.30, Helen Garfield came into the nightclub. She was looking as beautiful as ever, but seemed to be a little worried. Her blue eyes looked around the room until she saw me. Then, with a little smile, she walked up and sat down at the table. She sat next to me, with her back to the dance floor. She was carrying a bag which she put on the floor beside her. The smile disappeared from her face. Where were you this afternoon, Mr. Samuel? She said sharply. I'm paying you fifty dollars a day. In return for that money, I want you to do what I tell you. Now, why weren't you at your office this afternoon at five o'clock? I took a deep breath. Well, Miss Garfield, I said, it's a long story. Let's have a drink and I'll tell you all about it. A waiter came over and I ordered some drinks. When the waiter had gone, the beautiful blonde girl said, Come on, Mr. Samuel, tell me. Okay, I said, but stop calling me Mr. Samuel. Call me Len. All my friends call me Len. I'm not a friend of yours, Mr. Samuel, the blonde girl said in a voice like ice. I'm paying you a lot of money to work for me. Fifty dollars a day doesn't allow you to be rude to me, I replied quietly. In the last twenty-four hours, I've been hit on the head and suspected of murder. What do you mean? The girl said and leant towards me. Murder? Just then, the waiter brought the drinks, and we sat in silence until he had gone. Then I told Helen Garfield about my visit to her sister's apartment in the Manson building. I told her about the two men who had caught me there. Helen Garfield listened in silence. Do you like the band, Miss Garfield? I asked. I didn't come here to talk about the band, the blonde girl said angrily. The band has got a new drummer tonight, I said, because I found the old drummer dead in his bath this morning. The blonde girl turned around quickly to look at the band. She said something to herself, which I didn't hear. She lifted her right hand and started stroking her hair. She looked sad and very worried. What? What was the drummer? The dead man's name? Helen Garfield asked. Greep, I said. Benny Greep. I don't suppose that you know Benny Greep, do you? Helen Garfield shook her head. No, she said. I told her what had happened at the police station. Then I told her about the policeman who had followed me in a yellow car. Do you think they're still following you? The blonde girl asked quickly and looked around the club. I told her how I had got away from the yellow car. Now, Miss Garfield, I continued, it's time for me to ask you a few questions. There are some things about your sister's disappearance which worry me. I want to ask you about them. All right, she said, but I don't think I can help you. I don't know much about Elaine's life here. I don't know very much about Los Angeles, either. I sat back in my chair and looked at her. 
This beautiful blonde girl was paying me fifty dollars a day to find her sister. I liked what I saw. Then, very quietly, I began to ask Helen Garfield some questions. You don't know Los Angeles very well, I began. That's right, the girl replied. But you were able to find out where Elaine worked, I continued, and you went to Meyer and Meyer last Tuesday to ask if they knew anything about Elaine. Yes, the girl said, looking at me closely. Who did you speak to at Meyer and Meyer, I asked. Susie? No, the girl said. I spoke to Mr. Meyer. I want to ask you something else, I said. When I went to Elaine's flat, I noticed something unusual. There were very few clothes in the wardrobe. It seems your sister planned her disappearance quite carefully. She had taken her clothes with her. I see, the girl said and looked around the nightclub. I waited until she looked back at me. Do you like it here? I asked. Yes, she said. I like it too, I said, but there's something else which is worrying me. Do you mind if I ask you one more question? Not at all, the girl said. Well, I began... I've been wondering why you asked me to meet you here, at Las Cabanas. Helen Garfield pushed back her chair and stood up. Would you please excuse me for a minute, she said. She picked her bag up from the floor and walked over towards the lady's toilet, which was near the entrance. Would you like another drink? I shouted after her. Yes, please, she shouted back over her shoulder. I ordered two more drinks and sat back in my chair. I looked around the nightclub. It was almost midnight. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. I sat by the dance floor in Las Cabanas waiting for Helen Garfield to come back from the toilet. I was waiting for her to answer my question. I wanted to know why she had asked me to meet her here. I looked around at the people who were dancing. On the other side of the dance floor I could see people sitting, eating at the tables. Waiters were carrying food in and out of the two doors leading to the kitchen. I looked at my watch again. It was five past twelve. Ellen Garfield was taking a long time. I finished my drink and ordered another one. At ten past twelve, I got up and walked over towards the entrance. There was a man standing by the front door of the nightclub. I asked him if he had seen Helen. The beautiful blonde with blue eyes? The man asked. Yes, I said. She left nearly a quarter of an hour ago, said the man. Are you sure, I asked. Yes, the man replied. She asked me to get her a taxi. Did you hear her give the taxi driver an address, I asked quickly. The man shook his head. No, he said. I'm sorry. I thanked the man and walked back to my seat. Why did Helen Garfield leave without telling me, I asked myself. Perhaps some of the questions that I asked made her angry. Just then I looked up and saw a man walking across the dance floor towards me. I recognized the man. He was short, with red hair. He was looking at me and smiling in a rather unfriendly way. It was Joe, one of the men who had found me in Elaine Garfield's apartment. I decided to leave. I stood up and started to walk towards the door. I didn't want to meet Joe again. As I walked towards the door, I thought that I heard someone shouting. "'Excuse me, sir,' said a voice. I didn't stop or look around. Then I heard the voice again. Excuse me, sir, you haven't paid your bill. I had forgotten to pay for the drinks. The waiter came running up to me, and I quickly took out ten dollars and gave them to the waiter. You can keep the change, I said as I gave him the money. Without waiting for a reply, I turned and hurried towards the door. Then I heard the waiter's voice again. Excuse me, sir, excuse me, sir, he said. I stopped and turned around. The waiter came up to me. Excuse me, sir, ten dollars is not enough, he said. The price of your drinks is twelve dollars. Las Cabanas is very expensive, I said, as I gave the waiter another five dollars. Now you can keep the change. Then I stopped thinking about money. Joe was walking quickly towards me. I turned around and ran towards the door as fast as I could. I got to the door and was just about to leave Las Cabanas. I was happy because I had escaped. Then I got a surprise. There, standing by the door of the nightclub, was Joe's tall friend. It was the same man who had hit me on the head in Miss Garfield's apartment. The tall man had seen me coming and had moved in front of the door. Now I couldn't get out. 
The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. I stopped and looked behind me. Joe was closer now, and the smile on his face looked very unfriendly. I was caught. I could not go out of the door, and Joe was right behind me. I turned around quickly and ran towards Joe. Before he knew what I was doing, I put my arms around him and started dancing. He was very surprised and tried to pull away from me, but he couldn't fight properly. He was afraid that the other people would notice. I looked over my shoulder and saw the tall man standing helplessly on the side of the dance floor. I pushed Joe into the middle of the dance floor where there were lots of other people dancing. Then I felt something sharp touching my back. It was a knife. Stop trying to be funny, Samuel, said Joe angrily. Stop dancing and go over to the door or else I'll push this knife into you. We were right in the middle of the dance floor and a long way from the tall man. Joe was holding a knife against my back. Some of the other people around us had stopped dancing. They were staring in surprise at the sight of two men dancing together. I lifted my foot and kicked Joe's leg as hard as I could. He gave a cry of pain and fell to the floor. I looked around to see where I could run to. Joe's tall friend was coming through the dancers towards me. I turned around and ran off the dance floor. I looked back over my shoulder and saw that both Joe and his friend were following me. I ran between the tables where people were eating. The floor was slippery and I fell over. As I fell, I knocked over a table and the plates of food and glasses fell on top of me. I got up quickly and ran out through one of the doors into the kitchen. Then I stopped and counted to five. As Joe and his tall friend were coming towards the door, I pushed the door closed as hard as I could. There was a loud bang as the men ran into the door. I smiled and turned round, but I did not smile for very long. Three cooks were coming towards me with big kitchen knives in their hands. I looked at the cooks and at the knives they were holding. I thought about running towards them and trying to fight them. I decided that it would be a stupid idea to try and fight three big men with knives. To my left, there was a very big saucepan full of boiling soup on the stove. I picked it up and threw it at the cooks. There were loud cries of pain as the hot soup hit the three men. Just then, the door opened behind me. Joe and his tall friend stood in the doorway, and the tall man was holding a gun. There was a loud bang as the gun went off. The bang was followed by a scream of pain from one of the cooks because the tall man had shot him in the foot by mistake. I quickly picked up a large pile of dirty plates and threw them at Joe. He saw the plates coming and he tried to move away. As he moved, he slipped on the floor and fell onto a pile of broken plates. Without waiting, I ran to a door at the back of the kitchen. The door was locked and I banged against the door with my shoulder. The lock broke easily and I pushed the door open. As I ran out into the dark street, I could still hear the shouts and cries coming from the club. I came to the Chrysler and bent over to open the door. Just then there was a noise behind me. I turned around and saw a man with his arm raised. Then I felt a terrible pain in my head. Everything went black. I fell to the ground, unconscious. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. Feeling better now? asked a voice. I opened my eyes and looked around me. I didn't know where I was. I was lying on something hard and there was a bright light on my eyes. Where am I? I asked. Then I realized where I was. I recognized the gray walls, the hard furniture and the bright electric lights. I was in the police station again. Feeling better now? the voice repeated. I looked at the policeman who was talking to me. Yes, I said very slowly, but my head feels as if it is breaking in half. You're lucky to be alive, said the policeman. A police car found you lying in the middle of the road on Golden Drive. You would have been hit by passing cars and probably killed if the police car hadn't found you. I thought for a moment. I wasn't sure how much the police knew. I didn't want to tell the police anything they did not already know. Yes, I was lucky, I said. By the way, what was the police car doing on Golden Drive? Oh, said the policeman. There was a big fight at a nightclub called Las Cabanas. We had a telephone call to say that there was a madman in the club. The madman was breaking up all the furniture. A police car was sent to the nightclub, but the madman escaped before the police arrived. The police car was returning when it found you lying in the middle of the road. You were very lucky. The car nearly ran right over you. I smiled. 
I don't feel very lucky, I replied. In fact, I feel terrible. Never mind, said the policeman. Can you walk? I stood up and walked a few steps. My head hurt, but otherwise I felt all right. Yes, I said. I can walk. Good, the policeman said. Let's walk along the corridor, then, and have a talk with a friend of yours. We went along the corridor. The policeman stopped at a door and knocked. There was a shout from inside the room, and the policeman opened the door. I walked into the room, and the policeman followed. He shut the door and stood in front of it. There was only one desk in the room, and behind the desk was a man. He was bald. It was my old friend, Sergeant Murphy. Hello, Sergeant Murphy, I said, trying to smile. How are you feeling tonight? Sergeant Murphy didn't smile back at me. Are you trying to be funny? He asked. It isn't night, it's morning. You've been unconscious all night. Oh, I said. Now, said Sergeant Murphy, let's begin. I want you to tell me why you were lying unconscious in the middle of Golden Drive at half past twelve last night. You were a danger to the traffic. I thought that the traffic was a danger to me, I replied, but the sergeant didn't even smile. I'm waiting for you to tell me what happened, said the sergeant. Nothing much happened, I began. I spent part of the evening at Las Cabanas and left just before midnight. I walked back to my car. Just as I was about to get into the car, someone hit me over the head. That's the last I remember. This policeman, and I pointed to the one standing by the door, told me that I had been found in the middle of the road. Someone must have put me there. Sergeant Murphy smiled. Yes, he said. Someone who wanted to kill you put you in the middle of the road. Someone was hoping that a car would hit you and kill you. I smiled back at the sergeant. Can you think of anyone who would want to kill you? The sergeant asked me. Oh, yes, I replied. Hundreds of people would like to kill me, including a few policemen. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. Did you leave Las Cabanas before midnight? asked Sergeant Murphy. That's right, I replied. I left the nightclub just before twelve. So you weren't at Las Cabanas when the big fight started just after twelve? asked the sergeant. Big fight, I said, trying to sound surprised. Don't sound so surprised! said Sergeant Murphy angrily. We received a telephone call from the owner of Las Cabanas. He said that just after midnight last night, a tall man with brown hair and brown eyes called Lenny Samuel attacked two of the people at the club. The owner of the club said that you then attacked and injured three cooks. Then you broke over 100 plates and a table and ruined food worth several hundred dollars. I didn't say anything. I could not think of anything to say. Did you really do all that? Sergeant Murphy asked in a different voice. The sergeant sounded both surprised and pleased. Did you really do all that on your own? Or did you have men to help you? I did it all on my own, I said, beginning to feel a little proud of myself. You know that you could go to prison for six months for what you did last night, <laughs> the sergeant asked. He was laughing as he said it. I wasn't laughing. I couldn't see anything funny about six months in prison. Look, Sergeant Murphy said, I'm not stupid. I agreed with the sergeant that he was not stupid. I'm not stupid, Sergeant Murphy repeated, and I know why you were at Las Cabanas last night. Benny Greep used to work there, and you went to find out about his death. I agreed with the sergeant again. It seemed the best thing to do. Now, Sergeant Murphy said slowly, I'm interested in Las Cabanas. The club is owned by people who are criminals, but we can't prove that they have broken the law. I'm also interested in Benny Greep's murder. Now, what I suggest is this. Tell me all you know about Las Cabanas and Benny Greep, and I will let you go. If you tell me all you know, you won't go to prison for the fight at the nightclub. But I want the truth, not the lies you told me yesterday. I took a deep breath and started to tell the sergeant what I knew. I told him about everything except Elaine Garfield. I wasn't sure how closely Elaine Garfield was connected with Benny Greep's death, so I told the sergeant that Helen Garfield from New York had asked me to find out about Las Cabanas. Sergeant Murphy asked me for Helen Garfield's address in New York, and I said I didn't know it. 
Then the sergeant asked me where Helen Garfield was staying in Los Angeles. I said I didn't know. I told Sergeant Murphy all that I knew about Benny Greep, except that the drummer had known Elaine Garfield. Then I asked him about the two men in the yellow car who had followed me. The sergeant smiled and said that the two men were policemen. Finally, I told him about the fight at Las Cabanas. Sergeant Murphy listened to everything. When I had finished my story, he looked at me in silence for a few moments. Right, Samuel. I hope that you've told me the truth, and all the truth. If you've been telling me more lies, I'll make sure that you go to prison for six months because of the fight at Las Cabanas. Now you can go. I stood up. Thank you, I said with a smile. Sit down, he said, and listen. You can go, but you must promise to tell me anything you find out about Las Cabanas and about Benny Greep. I promise, I said quickly and stood up. Wait a minute, said Sergeant Murphy. I've one more thing to tell you. I'm going to telephone the New York police. I'm going to ask them to find out all they can about Helen Garfield. If the police in New York discover that you've told me lies about Helen Garfield, you will be in very serious trouble. I told the sergeant not to worry and thanked him very much. I left the police station feeling very happy because Sergeant Murphy had let me go. I called a taxi and went out to Golden Drive to get the Chrysler. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. I drove the Chrysler back to the office and walked up the stairs. The office looked just the same. There were no letters for me. I went down to the cafe and had a late breakfast. As I drank my coffee, I thought about some of the things Helen Garfield had told me at Las Cabanas before the fight. I decided to check one of the things immediately and walked over to the telephone. I opened the telephone book and looked under M until I found the telephone number of Meyer and Meyer. I picked up the telephone and dialed the number. Meyer and Meyer, good morning, said a voice which I recognized. Can I help you? Hello, Susie, I said. This is Len Samuel. Do you remember me? Of course I remember you, said Susie. Did your boyfriend win his boxing match on television, I asked. No, Susie replied. And anyway, he's not my boyfriend anymore. Really, I said happily, thinking that perhaps I could ask Susie to go for a drink with me. Yes, Susie said. The boxer had a fight with my new boyfriend outside my house last night. And who won, I asked. My new boyfriend, replied Susie. Oh, I said sadly, and what does your new boyfriend do? My new boyfriend's a weightlifter. He lifts big weights in competitions. I was about to say goodbye. Then I remembered that I had not telephoned to speak to Susie. I wanted to speak to her boss, Mr. Meyer. Can I speak to Mr. Meyer, please, Susie? I asked. Right, Susie said. I'll put you through to Mr. Meyer. Goodbye. There was a pause, and then I heard Mr. Meyer's voice. Hello, Meyer speaking. A good morning, Mr. Meyer, I said in a deep voice. I had put my handkerchief over the telephone so that Mr. Meyer would not know my voice. This is the police, I said. Sergeant Murphy speaking. I pretended to be Sergeant Murphy so that Mr. Meyer would answer my questions. Good morning, said Mr. Meyer. What do you want to ask me about? It's about a girl who works for you, I said. Her name is Elaine Garfield. She has disappeared, and we are trying to find her. Elaine's sister, Helen, came to see you last Tuesday, didn't she? No, said Mr. Meyer. Elaine's sister didn't come to see me last Tuesday. I didn't know that Elaine had a sister until a private detective told me. He said that Elaine's sister was called Helen. The telephone line was very bad, and it was difficult for me to hear what Mr. Meyer was saying. What did you say? I asked. I said that Elaine's sister was called Helen, replied Mr. Meyer. The names are very similar, aren't they? Thank you very much, Mr. Meyer. I said and put the telephone down. Mr. Meyer was right. The names Helen and Elaine were very similar. Elaine Garfield had disappeared, and so far I was the only person who had met Helen Garfield. I left the cafe and walked back up to my office. As I climbed the stairs, I could hear my telephone ringing. I didn't hurry. I walked slowly along the corridor into my office and answered the telephone. Is that Samuel? The voice said. I recognized the voice at once. 
It was Joe. Yes, I said. This is Len Samuel. Listen, Samuel, Joe said. We want Elaine Garfield, and we think you know where she is. We are coming to your office to see you. Wait for us. Don't go out. But I... I started, but it was too late. Joe had put the telephone down. I sat down at my desk, sadly. Now what's going to happen, I thought. Joe and his friend will come to see me. They'll ask me if I know where Elaine Garfield is, but I don't know where she is. I wonder if they will believe me when I tell them. The telephone rang again. I picked it up. Hello, I said. Hello, Samuel, said a familiar voice. Hello, Sergeant Murphy, I replied, trying to sound pleased. We've just telephoned New York the sergeant said angrily, and the New York police were very helpful. The New York police told us that there is no such person as Helen Garfield. Helen Garfield does not exist. There is no one living in New York called Helen Garfield. You were lying when you told me that you were working for Helen Garfield. But I started... Now listen! The sergeant interrupted. I am sending a police car round to your office. I want to see you. Wait for the police car. Don't go out. The sergeant put down the telephone, and I sat back in my chair. I was worried. What would happen now? Joe was coming to see me, and so was a policeman. I tried to think of what I would say to them both. I hoped that the policeman and Joe would not arrive at the same time. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. The telephone rang again. I was afraid to answer it. The telephone continued ringing. Finally, I did answer it. Hello, I said. Is that Mr. Samuel? Asked a voice. It was Helen Garfield. Yes, Miss Garfield, I replied. This is Len Samuel speaking. I must see you, said Helen Garfield. Well, I would like to talk to you too, Miss Garfield, I said slowly. I think there are a lot of things you and I must talk about. Right. The girl said. Meet me at the Seventh Man Cafe in five minutes. Do you know where the cafe is? It's about half a mile from your office. I know the Seventh Man, I replied, but I can't meet you in five minutes because I'm expecting visitors. You must come at once, Mr. Samuel, she said. But, I began, it was too late. Helen Garfield had put her telephone down. I got up from the chair and walked to the door. I decided to go and meet Helen Garfield. Both Joe and Sergeant Murphy had told me not to go out, but I decided I would rather talk to Helen Garfield than to the policeman or to Joe. If Joe and the policeman came when I was out, they could talk to each other. I left the building and drove the Chrysler down the road. I was very lucky because I was able to park right outside the seventh man. I walked into the cafe. Helen Garfield was sitting at a table in the corner. I walked over and sat down beside her. I asked the waiter for a cup of coffee. I drank the coffee without saying anything. Then I put the cup down and looked at the beautiful blonde girl sitting beside me. Miss Garfield, I said, you are a very beautiful girl, but I think you are a liar. I think that everything you've said to me has been lies. I don't think you've ever told me the truth. The blonde girl's face slowly became red. She looked straight at me. Mr. Samuel, she said, I'm paying you a lot of money to work for me. I asked you to find my sister. I didn't ask you to call me a liar. Well, Miss Garfield, I think I have found Elaine Garfield. Would you like me to tell you where she is? Yes, the blonde girl said. Where is Elaine? She's here in this cafe, I said. Elaine Garfield is sitting next to me. You are Elaine Garfield. Helen Garfield doesn't exist. You pretended to be Helen Garfield, but there really never was any such person. The police in New York say that Helen Garfield doesn't exist, I went on. Helen Garfield and Elaine Garfield are the same person. You are Elaine Garfield, and you pretended to be Helen. The blonde girl stood up angrily. How much money do you want, Mr. Samuel? You are no longer working for me, she shouted. Sit down, I said quietly. The blonde girl did not sit down, so I pulled her down beside me. Now listen, Miss Garfield, I said firmly. You are going to tell me all about yourself and why you came to see me. I want to know all about Benny Greep and Las Cabanas. I want to know why you disappeared. I won't tell you anything, 
she said. Oh, yes, you will tell me everything, I replied. You'll tell me everything, or else I'll take you straight to the police. You see, the police are looking for me at this moment. The police think that I may have killed Benny Greep, I continued. The police know that I had a fight at Las Cabanas last night. A red-haired man and his tall friend are also chasing me. They are the two men who started the fight at Las Cabanas. They will try to kill me if I don't tell them where you are. So you see, Miss Garfield, I think you had better tell me everything. I'm the only person who can help you. The blonde girl sat in silence for a minute. Then she began to cry. All right, she said. I'll tell you everything. I am Elaine Garfield. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at... I looked at the blonde girl. So, you agree that you're really Elaine Garfield and not Helen, I said quietly. Now tell me about Benny Greep. The girl took a deep breath. Susie Graham and I used to go out dancing together a lot, said Elaine. We often went to Las Cabanas. One night when we were there, I met a wonderful man called Benny. Benny was the drummer in the band. I liked him very much and went to the nightclub very often to see Benny. We became very good friends. The girl stopped again and took out her handkerchief. Go on, I said quietly. I used to go to Las Cabanas to see Benny nearly every night. But it was difficult for us to talk to each other. The girl continued. Why was it difficult for you and Benny to talk to each other, I asked. Because Benny was the drummer in the band, of course, Elaine Garfield replied. We couldn't talk to each other very much, because he was playing with the band most of the evening. I understand, I said, and ordered two more coffees. So I spent a lot of time in Las Cabanas watching Benny play the drums, the girl said. And I also watched everything else which happened in the nightclub. What did you see, I asked. I didn't notice anything unusual at first, the girl replied, but after a few nights, I noticed that the same people always came to the club at the same time. Which people, I asked. There was a red-haired man, a tall man who never took off his hat, and one or two others, said Elaine Garfield. Yes, I said, I think I have met two of them. They were the men who hit me on the head in the Manson building. Anyway, the girl continued, one night I asked Benny why these men came to the club every night. Benny told me not to ask questions, so I watched the men more carefully afterwards and noticed that they always arrived with bags. But when the men left, they weren't carrying bags. What did you do then, I asked. I asked Benny about the men again, she said. Benny said that there were a lot of strange things happening at Las Cabanas and that it was dangerous to ask questions. The waiter brought the coffees and Elaine waited until he had gone. One night, she continued, one of the men was sitting at the table next to me. He was talking to some other men, and he opened the bag that he was carrying. I was sitting quite close, and I could see into the bag. The bag was full of diamonds and jewelry. Really, I said, and drank my coffee. I told Benny about the bag of jewelry later on in the evening, continued Elaine. Benny was very excited at the news. He told me that he had known for a long time that criminals used Las Cabanas. They used the club as a place to buy and sell stolen things. Benny and I talked all evening about the bag of jewelry. Benny said that the jewelry was stolen. The men who were selling it were criminals, and they had stolen the jewelry. Well, Elaine continued, Benny wanted to steal one of the bags. He said that the jewelry was stolen, so it didn't matter if we stole it from the criminals. I agreed to help him. We hoped to sell the bag and to use the money to go away together. I see, I said. And did you help Benny to steal the bag of jewelry? Yes. We waited for nearly a week, Elaine replied. Then, last Sunday, I had a chance to steal the bag. It was at the end of the evening, and nearly everyone had left the club. I had found out where they hid the bag, and I was able to take it and give it to Benny. Benny had big bags in which he carried his drums. It was easy for him to hide the bag of jewelry in the drum bag. We left the club together with the bag of jewelry. We decided to hide the jewelry in my apartment and then sell it later. The next day was Monday, Elaine continued, and I went to work. In the afternoon, I had a telephone call from Benny. Benny said that the red-haired man knew that the bag of jewelry had been stolen. He was very angry. Benny told me to stop work and go home. He told me to stay at home to make sure that no one came to take the jewels. Benny was going to continue working at Las Cabanas. Then no one would think that he had stolen the jewels. And did you stay at home, I asked. 
Yes, I stayed at home for three days, Elaine replied, but I was afraid that the red-haired man would find out where I was living. Then he would come to get the bag of jewelry. So what did you do? I asked. That was easy, she said with a smile. I moved into a hotel in the center of the town and then came to see you. But why did you come to see me? I asked. To make sure that I was safe, said Elaine. I pretended to be my sister and said that I had disappeared. I asked you to find me. Then I knew that I was safe. Why? I asked. Because you were looking for me, Elaine continued. If the men from Las Cabanas found me or took me away, you would find out and chase them. Thank you very much for thinking that I am such a good detective, I said. But why didn't you tell me the truth? That's easy, said Elaine. I didn't want to tell you about the jewels. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. Go on with your story, I said. The evening I came to see you at your office, said Elaine, I telephoned Benny at Las Cabanas. I told Benny what I had done. Benny told me that the red-haired man knew that we had stolen the jewelry. Benny told me that there would be no trouble if I brought the jewels back to Las Cabanas the next night. You were stupid to trust the red-haired man, I said. I know, the girl said. I was afraid, so I asked you to meet me at Las Cabanas at midnight. So you didn't know that Benny was dead until I told you at Las Cabanas, I said. No, Elaine said. That is why I ran away before midnight. I decided not to give them the jewelry because they had killed Benny. You've still got the jewels then, I asked in surprise. Where are they? Here. Elaine said and pointed to a small bag under the table. I reached under the table, picked up the bag, and opened it. The bag was full of diamonds and jewelry. Just then I heard a voice, and at the same time, Elaine screamed. Give it to me, said the voice. I looked up quickly and saw Joe standing beside me. His tall friend was right behind him. Give me the bag, said Joe once again. How did you know I was here, I asked. You parked your car right outside, <laughs> said Joe with a laugh. Now give me the bag. I passed him the bag. As I gave him the bag, I jumped to my feet and hit Joe hard in the face. He tripped and fell heavily onto the floor. I moved towards the tall man who was still standing a few feet away. I was about to run at him, but then I stopped. The tall man had taken a gun from his pocket, and the gun was pointing straight at me. Right, said the tall man. Don't move or else I'll shoot you. Joe got up from the floor. He still had the bag of jewelry in his hand. Together, Joe and his friend with the gun walked towards the door. They walked backwards to make sure that Elaine and I did not try to get the bag back. As the two men reached the door, I started to laugh. What are you laughing at? shouted the man with the gun. <laughs> Look behind you, I said. Both men turned around and looked. In the doorway of the cafe stood Sergeant Murphy with two other policemen. Sergeant Murphy jumped on the tall man with the gun, and Joe ran back into the cafe. I stepped forward to stop Joe, and he ran straight into me. We both fell on the floor, and the two policemen ran up. One of the policemen held Joe. The other policeman held me. They are the criminals, I shouted, pointing at Joe and his friend. Not me. You are all coming down to the police station, Sergeant Murphy said and looked over to Elaine Garfield. You must come, too. It took a long time to tell Sergeant Murphy the whole story. In the end, he believed what Elaine and I told him. The sergeant warned me not to tell him lies again, and agreed to let me go free. Elaine told Sergeant Murphy all she knew about Las Cabanas. The sergeant was very pleased to catch Joe and his friend with the jewels. Sergeant Murphy agreed to let Elaine go free because she helped catch the criminals. As we were leaving the police station, I asked Sergeant Murphy how he had found us in the Seventh Man Cafe. It was very lucky, really, said the sergeant. We went to your office to see you, but you weren't there. As we were leaving, we saw the red-haired man and his friend entering. We waited, and when they left, we followed them to the cafe. Thank you very much, Sergeant, said Elaine. And thank you very much, Mr. Samuel. That's all right, I said. You are paying me fifty dollars a day. I'm sorry, Mr. Samuel, Elaine said. I'm afraid I can't pay you. Now that I've given the jewels to the police, I don't have any money.
I smiled and got into the old gray Chrysler and drove back to the office. I didn't say goodbye. When I got back to the office, I sat down in my chair. It's not much fun being a private eye. You get hit on the head, nearly killed and chased by the police. And you don't always get paid. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once.